Okay, so real quick, I just want to start a new topic. This one is going to be computation, and it's going to be uh, split into a few parts. First one is going to be on algorithms, that's what we're going to go over right quick. There's going to be another one going over time complexities, and finally we'll go to another one over computational models. So, it's going to be three videos this time, let's go ahead and take a look at the first part real quick. So, basic introduction in computation, we're going to look into basic algorithms. So, essentially, any algorithm is going to be something that we can devise a step-by-step -step method to solve some particular problem. Now, it doesn't matter the complexity of the problem, just so long as we can achieve figuring some step-by-step -step method to solve it. This can vary from something very simple like a distance formula, maybe you figure out the perimeter of any shape, circumference of a circle, something like that. These would all be some form of algorithm. These can also scale up to far more complex systems like various sorting and searching algorithms. So something that just has some step-by-step -step method. Now, when it comes to actually describing these algorithms, do we have a few distinctions that we typically have? We have some name for it, description of the task performed, descriptions of both the inputs and the outputs, and then finally the actual sequence of steps to follow. Again, this being the primary aspect of the step-by-step -step method that is necessary to solve a problem. So here we have a very, very simple example. We have sum of three. This is going to be the name that's already there. We have this algorithm finds the sum of three numbers, that being our description. The input, real numbers A, B, and C, some variables here. That's going to be description of the input. Then we have the output, sum, the sum of A, B, and C. Yep. And then finally, we have the actual steps. So we are going to use some pseudocode here. So we have sum as a variable that is being assigned the values of A plus B plus C. That being the inputs up here, add all of them together, assign them to the variable sum, and then finally return that sum. So if we have, and this is the steps, my bad. So if we have the actual trial run, we have A equals seven, B equals eight, C equals nine. So seven plus eight plus nine, sum equals a plus b plus c, 7 plus 8 plus 9 equals 24. And that would be what we return. And that's our algorithm. So again, doesn't matter how complex this one being extremely simple, we still have some descriptions of the overall algorithm, a name for it, descriptions of our inputs and outputs, and then the actual steps that we're going to follow. So again, this constitutes some algorithm. Now, regarding the complexity of algorithms, this is going to be a topic that we touch on more in the second video, which is going to be a follow-up to this one. But, we need a set of baseline for what I mean by complexity and why we care about it. So, when we're given some problem, there is usually going to be multiple ways of achieving a solution. And this yields multiple choices of algorithms that we can use. Now, when we select between these, there's generally going to be fairly dramatic effects on how efficiently we achieve this solution. And this yields what is known as the computational complexity of an algorithm, which is basically the amount of resources that algorithm uses. And the resources are broken down into two different types. One of the time complexity, that is the time the algorithm requires to run. So again, time. Next is spatial complexity, that is the amount of memory is used in space. Essentially, space complexity is a little bit vague, but you can view it as some algorithms are going to require additional storage and RAM to store maybe in sorting algorithms. Sometimes you have a chunk of data that gets sorted and you want to store that separately. So that's going to take up memory. And that gets pretty expensive because the only way you can improve that is to either store less data or get more memory but with time complexity that's a different scenario because it's far easier to explain how we optimize this and a bit easier to visualize how we do so as well so the time complexity of an algorithm is defined as such it's a function that maps all positive integers to all positive integers such that f of n is the maximum number of atomic operations performed by the algorithm on any input of size n. And what do you mean by atomic operations? Well, 
You can view them as the basic building blocks for measuring time complexity logarithms. And that is going to be basic instructions like assignments, arithmetic operations, comparisons, return statements, a lot of different things. Every time you do an if statement, every time you do assigning to a variable, some loop, these all yield more operations that an algorithm has to do. Therefore, the more actual work that needs to be done in that algorithm, it's going to cause time complexity to grow because it needs to do more actual individual operations. So we take a look here, we have some algorithm called compute sum with inputs of A1, A2 through AN. In the length of the actual sequence, the output is the sum of the numbers in the sequence. And we start very simply with the basic assignment operation, which is assigning the variable sum to zero. Following this, we have a loop. So we have for loop. So for i equals one to n, Everyone can tell that loop is iterated n times. Then we have assignment operation here, and an addition operation here. So sum plus a i, which is the current iteration of i here. So we assign to sum, and then we end our for loop. And finally, we have a return operation returning the value of sum that has been continuously added to as we loop through this loop. So we have one assignment operation. We loop iterated n times. And then you can see that we're going to have a certain amount of operations per loop. And then finally, we have one operation for the return. So that's one for the return, one for the assignment. And these exist outside the loop, so they're statically just two. Not a big deal. Now let's take a look at C and D here. The for loop test i and increments i, which is two operations. So we are saying for i equals one to n. So we need to make sure that we are in the range of this for loop. So that's one operation. And we are also incrementing it. So that's another operation. That's two per iteration of the for loop. And the actual body of the loop, we have the addition operation and then the assignment operation, that's another two. So each of these iterations are gonna be four. So we take a look at the function number of operations on a sequence of length n. Then we have f of n equals one to a plus n, which is the number of loops, two plus two, c and d here, plus one, which is e which we can quantify as one plus four n plus one, which equals four n plus two. So if we pass in, um, let me think, six. So n equals six. We can tell that we're gonna loop six times. So four, the number of operations in the loop times six, the number of times we're gonna loop, plus two, which is the assignment operation outside the loop, and the return statement outside the loop, so it's static two. Four times six is 24 plus two. This will take 26 atomic operations to complete. So this one isn't too bad. We can tell then we add loops, then it's going to grow the amount of operations quite quickly if we're not careful. So let's take a look at some graphs of pretty common growth rate. So the one we're looking at here is basically going to look at the number of elements are passed in. So we have one, two, three, so on and so forth until we get to 10. And then the actual number of computations being done start at zero, going to 12. But what we have here, this looks like one, and you tell right there, that's a, that's a constant one. So this is constant runtime. Whenever we pass in any number of elements, it's always just going to do a single operation. So one computation is being done, therefore it has a constant time of one, therefore it has no growth rate, it's just constant. This is impossibly ideal. It's not even really an algorithm, it's just doing one operation, but it is some baseline to compare against. Moving on, we have two more ideal realistic expectations that we'd like to achieve when it comes to doing algorithms, and that is logarithmic which is log in right here this yellow line 
And then we have linear, is N, is quantified by the uh, kind of tannish brown line. So, if we take a look at constant time, it's always one computation. We get to logarithmic, it's Basically, one goes in, we get zero computations, we have two, it's around one, three goes to one, four. You see it starts growing, but very, very slowly, and it's following log of n. Whereas linear, we have one input, we have one computation. We have two inputs, we have two computations. Three inputs, three computations, and it follows a linear path. Number of computations is going to be equal to n, with n being the number of elements. So these two, linear particularly, is going to be something that you can achieve fairly easily. Logarithmic time is extremely good. Um, probably one of the most ideal run times you can get. And not always something that's very achievable. So these are probably the two more ideal complexities that you want to get from an algorithm. Because constant is just completely unreal, unrealistic. Moving on, we start to see where things are going to climb and escalate pretty nastily. The first one we have linear rhythmic, which is n log n. And you can see that it's, it's multiplying log of n by linear, so it's going to be worse than both of these. But it's not, it's not that bad. It's not amazing compared to the previous ones, but I, I would say that this one is a pretty decent runtime, honestly. You have 10 inputs, you're getting around 20 computations. It's, it's, it's believably good, honestly. And then we get to quadratic time or n squared time. And then you can kind of see how things can get out of hand pretty quickly. So look down here, we're now in the right measuring range to 20, 40, 60, 80, up to 120, because quadratic is pretty bad once you scale up. So one gives us one, two gives us four, three gives us nine, four gives us 16, 25, 36, 49, and so on and so forth, and eventually we have 100. So we scale up to, I don't know, 100 inputs, now we have 100 times 100, which is gonna be, oh, oh, oh. 100 or 10,000 inputs essentially and you can see that things are going to get out of hand very 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 quickly and these aren't even the worst ones so we have two more that are significantly worse uh, we have the first one which is going to be exponential time to the n which this is egregiously bad the, we're in the range of 200, 400, 600, up to 1200, which is now me 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4, and it's okay, sort of, as we're here, but then you can see things really start to take a turn for the worse as we are at 10 inputs, and now we're over 1000 computations, so this is terrible. Quadratic is really bad. Uh, let's say linear rhythmic is as is probably the worst that you would want to actually go. Quadratic is doable, but it's it's really really bad. But exponential is impossibly bad. And then we have one more that's worse. There are more in this, but this is. This is showing factorial, and we're at 4 million. You're now measuring in the millions computation, so this this n factorial is, is just monstrously awful. So the, the last ones, the last one here is mostly a joke. Constant time is just a baseline, unrealistic, n factorial is unrealistically bad log in is kind of a gold standard ideal if you can achieve this it's incredible linear and linear rhythmic are pretty humanly doable and i'd say they're pretty decent runtimes quadratic it's 
it, it exists it's not the worst thing in the world and then once you hit exponential this is just un unacceptable and then you hit uh and, and vectorial and this is just this is absolutely unacceptable and then finally we will look at those previous runtimes at least some of those previous runtimes and quantify those two numbers because what we're doing in the previous slides is looking at the number of computations being handled this is going to be looking at the actual time that has passed as the inputs grow so if we look at logarithmic time of log n in inputs i mean 3.3 microseconds amazing scale it up to 100,000 and now all of a sudden we're at 16.6 .6 microseconds again this is incredible this is amazing and then we hit linear 10 inputs is 10 microseconds 15 inputs 50 microseconds it scales linearly so once we get to 100,000 we're now at 0.1 seconds I mean, this is really good I can I could wait 0.1 seconds for something to run that's not too bad and then we hit the idea of linear rhythmic and you can see already right off the bat it's not amazing because now we're measuring off the rip at milliseconds as opposed to microseconds and it stays in milliseconds up to a thousand and then all of a sudden now we're measuring in seconds which is, I means 0.133 seconds for 10,000 inputs that's still really good but you can tell pretty quickly that microseconds isn't even being accounted for, so this is a magnitude worse than something in the realm of this. And then finally, for 100,000, we're at 1.67 seconds. So all of a sudden, now we waited almost two seconds. And again, that's really good. That's really good. I could wait 1.67 seconds, but you can tell that 1.67 seconds is a good bit worse than 0.1 seconds. And then that is a good bit worse than 16.6 .6 seconds, just in terms of scale and magnitude. But then we get to quadratic. And we are already at 0.1 seconds, or 0.1 milliseconds, I'm sorry. And then we go to 2.5 milliseconds, that's, that was a pretty big jump. And then we go to 10 milliseconds, and that was also pretty large. All of a sudden we're at one whole second. And then we go up to 10,000, now we're at 100 seconds. Now we're over a minute. And, and then this happens. We go to 100,000, and now we're 2.8 hours. So this is where things start getting really bad. Because, right, I mean, for 10,000 inputs, I'm waiting 100 seconds. I can wait a little over a minute and a half. That's not too bad, but 2.8 hours? There's no way. It's, it's so bad. And then we hit cubic. And this is just a different... Uh, power so it's not gonna be significant well it's gonna be significantly worse but compared to exponential it's not gonna be that much worse but we start at one millisecond already worse than anything go up to point one two five seconds now start at one second then we hit 16.7 minutes that's significantly worse than one second here and then where we're waiting 100 seconds on quadratic and cubic we're waiting 11.6 days and then where we had 2.8 hours we're now waiting 31.7 years entirely unacceptable this is this is the worst that you would want to go anything beyond this is it's just not acceptable and then we look at exponential and it's just you're at 50 inputs you're at 35.7 years and then things cannot be counted easily because we're at 10 to the 16, 10 to the 287, and all of a sudden at 10,000 inputs, you're now at 10 to the 2,996. It's, it, it scales horribly. Again, this could be the absolute worst that you're dealing with. Or these are probably the more realistic human ones that you want to quantify at as in or linear time and then in log in for linear rhythmic time. If you can get if you get log with the time that's incredible so that is essentially going to be my basic instrument to algorithms it's kind of a introduction to see 
a basic example of what they are, a description of what they are, and then kind of an analysis on seeing that not all algorithms are made equally. Some are drastically better than others, and you can quantify that by the number of operations that each one does as the number of inputs to the system grows. And then we also just took a quick look at some of the graphs to show the number of operations at scale as the input scale as well. So that's all I got for this. We'll get to more detailed analysis on time complexity in the next video. I'll see you there.